Assistant Director, and I'm extremely happy to be here today introducing our maker in residence for the month of February. About six months ago, Gar Waterman came to me with an idea. He said, I'd like to talk to you about doing something that would bring the makerspace to another level. And I said, well, what do you have in mind? And he explained that as a recent graduate, a biomedical engineer, that he had a skill with SOLIDWORKS, which is a software program that's a very high level design program. And it turns out that we can get an educational version of this, which we did. And he has taught three classes of SOLIDWORKS here at the library. And they actually did bring the makerspace to a new level because we are dealing with, in those cases, training former engineers who want new skills, mostly po a lot of postgraduate uh, participants. It started with just a, a middle school and high school, but once people heard about it, we now have an issue where we're going to lose GAR, but we still want to find somebody who can teach SOLIDWORKS. So what he brought to the library was that incredible new high-level um, service that we are now providing, which brought the makerspace to another level. So you succeeded at that. Okay, but then it didn't stop there, because we have monthly maker in residence. And our first did the digital quilt behind you, which you can touch a little, little square over there and make the light come on. We had a Melissa Slattery in January who helped create a, a new kind of a book. But Gar took on the task of creating a mobile slash pop-up office space. Now, I have to give you one more piece of information. I am a digital nomad. I do not have an office. And that was relatively new. I chose that in October. But this could very well be a solution to my digital nomadness. And I, I, I will, we'll see how it goes, but at least there is the possibility that this mobile office space could be used by someone who doesn't have an office. So I'm looking forward to the possibility of considering this um, an experiment for me and, and my office space. So Gar has been working for a month right over there, outside the makerspace, getting ideas. He's going to explain the ideas that he got, how he interpret them, and what the result of all of his planning and work was. So, yes, you made a difference here at the library, and this today will even be more considerable. So, thank you for all your work. And thank you. So, thank you all for uh, taking the time to uh, listen to my nonsense. But, uh, so, the objective here, I'm going to switch over to my presentation there. Uh, the objective of this project was two, possibly even threefold. Uh, first, uh, was as an extension to my educational effort to the library here, I wanted to expose the process of design, uh, making the design process a little bit more transparent, a little less intimidating. Uh, what I gathered during my experience teaching the solid classes, uh, well as uh, working throughout the rest of my career, is that when people see this blank slate, they have an idea that they want to do something, there's a niche that needs to be fulfilled. Uh, then they see that, but then they become put off by the idea of actually bringing all the resources together to make it happen. Uh, all of the drawings that you need to do to make a wonderful uh, product. Uh, all of the people and resources that you need to wrangle to make that happen. And really, it's not all that hard. Anybody can do this. I mean, nobody can do this. My profession is very important. But nonetheless, anybody can do this. And I'm hoping that at this time, any people who have been exposed to this project uh, have at least glimpsed that, uh, if not embraced it. Um, the second fold, so to say, is uh, addressing uh, the need for mobile workspace. The first fold is in the context of the second. Uh, and it was inspired by uh, two things. One was uh, Bill's madness, 
because I believe the word we coined today, remember it all. Um, and the second is uh, the library's needs itself. Uh, we have a couple wonderful conference rooms in the back, as well as a whole bunch of other meeting spaces. Uh, the conference rooms, for example, are, are requested almost 300 times every month. Uh, and not all of these uh, can be filled, so uh, questions asked, what can we do about it? So, uh, in case, uh, just to fill in a little bit more about uh, myself, where I'm coming from, uh, I'm a trained uh, biomedical engineer, uh, at least that's what I graduated as, uh, which means I work on primarily medical devices, uh, upstream development, which means uh, bringing things uh, from an idea to an actual prototype, something that works. Uh, and those skills are really what help drive my uh, working in, on this project. Um, I also consider myself a teacher and organizer. And, uh, the, uh, the, most, of, uh, most of my efforts there have been at the library uh, during my time between my last job as a uh, research technologist at Penn State uh, and my new job, which I'll be going to in March. Uh, and when I'm not uh, innovating, to flatter myself, uh, I like to propose dinner parties and build furniture for such things. So I am a backpacker and history buff. So uh, we can talk about that after. Uh, so uh, addressing what I was talking about uh, with the library and its need for space, let's take a look at what the library does, what, li what libraries in general do these days. And it's not just a repository and archive for books anymore, just for physical media. Libraries have become digital. We have a space for computers and that's been around for a while. We have uh, solid classes. We have these 3D printers in a maker space. It's not, it's, these needs are changing. How people use the library is changing. Um, and how does a static space, something that you set up once, address these changing needs? You know, they seem to conflict with one another. And the solution, of course, is mobility and flexibility. Um, I just pulled some images off of the website. Uh, for those of you that were here at the beginning of my time, thank you guys for coming again. Um, you'll recognize this. Uh, there is, there was at least a uh, group reading uh, about Julia Child. Uh, job seekers, uh, folks talking about business. Uh, there's a patent guy that came in and talked about how to patent your devices and that sort of thing. There's tech health that goes on, I think, almost every day. Uh, and it's extremely popular. Uh, there's things, there's an extension of that, there's things like my software classes. Uh, we have makerspace, film clubs, uh, people who want to do video conferencing, all sorts of different things. Again, the question is how do we accommodate this in a static space? So once we took a look at what the library does and what, the sort, of act, what sort of activities people are participating in, we can funnel ideas uh, for how to address these needs into a couple of different categories. And this just makes uh, a little bit easier uh, looking at the context of these ideas. Uh, first, and probably foremost, is mobility. Uh, we're, again, uh, static is contradictory to dynamic, at least in, in a lot of cases, uh, especially since the library is going to be changing it up in terms of facilities very soon. Mobility is going to be a huge need. Uh, multiple purposes. Like, there are, again, many people who use the space for many different purposes, so how do we make something that accommodates all of those but still does it well? Another thing is multiple people. Uh, again, the conference rooms, conferencing, it's intuitively that there's multiple people being involved. When you rent a space, it's usually uh, not rent. When you ask to have a space, it's usually not just you going in and having a private study space. Uh, and the last, of course, to make it appropriate for a library setting. Uh, you know, we're not going to make your uh, your music recording studio, but that would be pretty cool if we could. Um, and again, though, it's not just about you know this is the library because I mean, look over here we have a maker space where people are yelling, tinkering, and banging on things, and I'm sure I've said more than one person drilling and sawing over <laughs> just next to it. Uh, so as we move forward, think about these these categories. So. Uh, and here are a couple of questions uh, that we can think about uh, to stimulate uh, fundamental ideas in those categories. Uh, what are the people doing in the 
activities. When do they need it? Like how often, for example? Again, this is you know, driving at the numbers of uh, people asking for conference spaces. Uh, what is the space they need, and why do they want it? Um, and what do they need to actually do what they do? Like this video conferencing, they need hey, a computer, at least a video camera, like with Skype, you know, that sort of thing. So, um, just to give you a framework of how this project played out, uh, the first like one or two weeks was really ideation. And this started with a kickoff uh, that uh, these three people here uh, were involved in, which is fantastic. Uh, we generated a huge wealth of ideas. Um, and this continued uh, after the kickoff on this board right here, which has all sorts of fantastic Ideas drawn by all sorts of different people. And I use this board too, uh, just so when people are looking at it, they can uh, they can get inspiration from what has been drawn before. I mean, someone actually I drew like this egg space that was on some wheels, and it's fantastic. Uh, so, back to that. Uh, the uh, weeks after that, so, uh, two and three were realization, uh, and after that, expansion and development. Uh, and of course, the first objective is to actually build something, a, a template, a dynamic space that is mobile, you know, meeting the most very basic needs of everybody. So uh, that has been accomplished, and finally we're on the wrap-up, uh, which is uh, presenting that space, as well as looking at what can be done in the future. Because really, uh, when I have these two bullet uh, objectives of educating about design and getting people to participate that in that, uh, as much as actually constructing something, we, we don't have a complete space yet. This is, I want to make that clear, is people, uh, I'm hoping that people would come back and participate in making, taking this space to the next level. So, keep that in mind. Uh, during my time, there were a couple of persistent elements that I provided uh, to, get, to keep people involved and informed about what's going on. Uh, first is the Maker and Residence Inspiration Station email. Uh, so this is something that if I wasn't working at my desk during after my office hours, people could email me anytime. And what I asked to provide was some sort of headline, uh, like, for example, hoverboards on the bottom to make it float. And then their initials, which uh, allowed me to add that idea to what I called the Idea Heritage Tree, which I'll show you a little bit later, uh, which is a branching and very much interconnected web of ideas uh, in each of those the categories I talked about earlier. I'm going to get a little bit more into that later. The last thing was the design history file. I'm going to pass out a couple of different pieces of it um, and you know just float that around if you will, please. Um, which talks a little bit about um, myself, egotistically, of course, and. Uh, a little bit more background about the project, uh, what we've done. Uh, some, there are some inspirational materials, which uh, let's take a look at now. Um, so uh, these are the three things that you'll see in, this, uh, in that section of the design history file. Uh, this was sort of an, uh, an addendum. Uh, it was one of the designs that was included there. Uh, first is uh, adding rooms, folding rooms. This is actually an art project. But here's the part that probably had the most direct impact on the project. There was this idea that you could have a 2D object that became 3D. You add dimensionality by taking advantage of the particular joint and geometry of the space, um, which I thought was pretty cool. You, have, uh, you also have uh, folks doing uh, a little bit more artsy, you know, think about you know, walking around in Bushwick or Brooklyn. Oh, the picture's not loading, that's good. Um, that's what you'll see it in the design history file. It's essentially um, an armoire that folds out into a V, and there's a desk on one side with some shelves, and there's a chair that's involved, which is great. Um, and the last, I'd like to present is the Grunkanto. Uh, which I believe is uh, Danish for wheelbarrow office. Um, and this it comes in this whole self-contained lock. You can see a chair here. Uh, this is the 
Uh, it has another chair. It has a coffee maker. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to demonstrate how it pulls out. You can wheel it around. Here's the handle for your wheelbarrow. And there's the wheel. You pull out the chair. You pull out a second chair. And you slot that table. That oh. And one of the very first ideas that I stepped out was doing, uh, doing something very much like this, putting together uh, the uh, chairs and the desk, and, but library specific, uh, but meaning library specific needs. Um, and it turns out that doing something like this is uh, quite complicated and rather expensive. So we couldn't address it that way. So then we move on to the next one. Great. So uh, I'm going to take you through some pictures, if everybody likes pictures, uh, of the process that we went through. Again, first was ideation. Here's actually all of the, uh, each one of these, um, each one of these post-its was an idea. Um, here's the infamous post-it pad. Uh, made it all happen. Uh, and this was uh, the result of the kickoff kick session. Um, and I, well, not all of the ideas made it to the final project. And not all of the even practical ones made it to the final project, but I'd love to see the team members come in today. But I just wanted to give credence and at least attention to some of these because I think these are fantastic. Uh, so you come with a uh, sound from drummer's hotel. So, uh, wall the whole thing in with stick foam and that sort of thing. Uh, so you can't hear anything from the outside, you can't hear anything from the inside. Uh, Doctor Who phone booth, more space from the inside than from the outside. Uh, this was actually uh, contributed a lot to this final design. Uh, it was, again, it was the idea of adding a dimension, which I thought was pretty cool. Too. Elevator room lifts above the fray. So imagine like you, you roll up the space, and then instead of being on the ground where people can buy it, you know, it comes up and you're sitting like, in the clouds of the library. That's pretty cool. Uh, air chair floats you in midair. Like, why not? You have our chair, and it's on. Just floats like you're in a Lexus or something. Okay. Um, remote control and auto move, it automatically detects. I think the extension of this idea was that it automatically detects where in the library the least amount of noise is, and then it like, powered wheels and sort of zooms around the library, finding where it's the best it is for you to work. Um, another uh, idea that contributed a lot to uh, the final design here was. Uh, or where it is, uh, uh, we started talking about a geodesic dome. And geodesic dome uh, idea really sort of reinforced, like, taking advantage of geometry and dimensionality, uh, which was really attractive to me as someone who loves math, at least the applications of math. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll hand around this physical model that I put together um, a while back, uh, adding dimensionality to folding triangles. Um, another one was a built-in library, uh, if you had like a little touch screen or at least a video screen, where you could actually interact with either a live librarian or like a computerized librarian who could help you find the books you need or help you find the resources you need that aren't necessarily at the space of writing. Uh, my personal favorite, and I've all admit this is one I had, a fireplace, I love a fireplace, but uh, work in a robot transformer, why not, you know? It's, uh, you get into the space and it's like an Iron Man suit and then you can like do all everything you need to do in that space. Um, decorated by community members uh, is something that I really hope continues to happen. I've, actually, this is, of all the general ideas for something, making something happen, this is probably the most, uh, most addressed by people, even if they didn't know this idea existed before. Uh, I've had people come in and say, hey, let's, uh, let's decorate the outside with previous design ideas for the project. Uh, let's take old dust jackets from books uh, and lacquer them on the outside of, in a montage, which would be great. Um, hoverboards was one of the ideas, and possibly my favorite, I'm the boss of my sister, which was contributed by five-year-old Albert uh, in one of the, the initial kickoff. And that, that actually generated later ideas, which you, know, you wouldn't think, like he also contributed Maker Space is cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, two plus two plus two equals six. Um, you know, 
that the, the, the point of the kickoff is to gather, not to reject. So all these ideas, including Alberts and I don't know else they're referring to. But, <laughs> um, and all those ideas up, went out there because the point is you don't know what's going to influence you later. And one of Albert's ideas, I'm the boss, my sister contributed, uh, which I think is a fantastic example. Uh, one of the first steps I did after uh, collecting a huge variety of ideas to do some research, and this will help us narrow it down and collect them. Uh, let's take a look at what we took, we took a look at. Library spaces, for example, this space right here, measured in dimensions. Like what, sort of, what sort of mobile office could actually fit in here? Uh, there's a space up there on the, on the second floor uh, where it can fit. There's spaces back there and in the other along the back wall where it could go. Like how big is that? And that'll start to give us an idea. It's going to be at least four to four or five feet. It's going to be at most 10 to 14 feet. You know, as soon as we start getting these numbers, it starts helping help us form in our mind what it's actually going to end up looking like. And again, the workspace. Like, how big of a desk do you actually need? You could work on a little foot by foot square if you, you know, kept moving your paper to have room, but not so great. So let's take a look at the rest of the workspaces in the library. Measure a desk, measure the margin that a chair occupies around it, because hey, you don't just need a desk, you need a place to sit, hopefully, unless you're going to be standing in that space, but maybe that's, maybe that's an idea, or why not? So uh, the next uh, phase was starting to invest uh, mentally in some ideas. Uh, and this week, there were five different plans that were invested in. Uh, one was uh, the adding a folding room idea, uh, which I sketched out some joints and whatnot for it uh, to make it work. Uh, didn't end up being practical. Uh, and here are Two examples of the folding triangles. Uh, we have the model right there, which is fantastic. Yeah, I can go on the table right there, thank you. Uh, and here's a CAD model I put together, together in SOLIDWORKS uh, for it. And as you start to sketch these ideas and actually make them uh, out of physical models, it, again, helps us uh, get an idea of what it'll end up looking like. Uh, next stage is actually prototyping, making the scale space. Um, and what, one of the ideas was uh, doing these tires here. You can see the remains uh, behind you uh, next to where I work. And this idea was uh, especially attractive because it's extremely cheap and sustainable. You can build as many of these as you want for about $6 for a section, uh, which is fantastic. But they're stinky uh, and they are not exactly the most attractive elements in the world. Uh, didn't really make the aesthetic of the library. And stabilization is also an issue. Uh, so it was eventually scrapped for those, uh, for those reasons. But nonetheless, we work in a uh, context uh, where the aesthetic and uh, smell-related uh, aspects were not as much of an issue. Uh, and here's the base that I'm going to be showing you later, and there's a couple of, uh, more things added, uh, of what we ended up going with. And the last stage uh, is development. And this is what I'm leaving to you guys. This is a uh, legacy that you will continue. Uh, I'm hoping. Uh, and that's uh, adding on to this, really making it complete, really filling it out. So uh, what's next? Uh, before we do that, uh, I'd like to actually present the space. So my lovely is
first piece that's going to come out is the bottom. We have our caster wheels that help that swing out. The next element is going to come down. It's this guy. And okay, maybe there's some, some of you are thinking, this needs some instructions. I agree. <laughs> and our first sandwich here is going to help stabilize this wall. Goes into one wall, fits on the other. Now it's a sturdy wall. Here's our second wall coming together. And here's our shelf. Again, not level, but thank you very much. And finally, our best. So uh, these walls can be spread out. So um, one of the one of my possibly one of my favorite ideas for uh, developing this further is to make all four of them. And to have these 120 degrees and you can lock them in place, perhaps by another some more folding elements that interact with this desk. Uh, this whole piece is half the hexagon. Uh, so you can actually make a honeycomb as these are arranged right here. You have one, two, three, uh, each of the sides uh, against each other. And then the fourth one can slide in the back. And you have a nice compact uh, little cluster of desks. Uh, it looks very much like a bee. Bees, I don't remember what that was like. Uh, so uh, what I'd like to do right now is actually, uh, we're, we're going to end the presentation. I'm going to give some acknowledgments before that. But I'd like to invite uh, any and all of you to come up uh, and play with the space. Like, um, and I'd you know, love to get some feedback on this sort of thing. There are a couple pens here. Thank you for those. But we're going to continue adding to this um, right now, if you feel like it. So um, after I do my acknowledgments, uh, come on up. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, as I said, some shout outs. Uh, Bill, thank you so much for making this happen. Uh, very much appreciated making sure everything ran smoothly. Uh, other library. Uh, Staff include the lovely Margie, uh, my lovely mother uh, Mary Sue right here. Thank you, Mom. Um, uh, Bonnie, Betty, and uh, particularly Glenn, who's downstairs doing building uh, maintenance and that sort of thing, uh, letting me borrow and give us tools and that sort of thing. Uh, really just being on point for making things happen, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, this is all funded by a wonderful IMLS grant, uh, which the library, your wonderful library staff, uh, really fought for. Really competitive, so make sure to thank them for making the make things like the makerspace, and hopefully you've enjoyed this uh, happen as a result of their efforts. Uh, folks that came in and worked on it on their own time, um, I'd like to thank uh, Kelly, thank you, uh, Michigan Yang, uh, Igor, thank you very much, uh, Josh, Betsy, Betsy, and Albert. Uh, Albert was the one who was uh, the boss of my sister, uh, Claudine. Thank you very much. Uh, June and Emily, who is not in the makerspace, and I'm sure there were countless people who could help contribute to this, and I'm sure I'm missing some of them, but thank you very much. So, I see. So, thank you all.